Good evening. Welcome to you all. Um, thanks to those of you who got started already on our word cloud here. Um, we'll have a chance to revisit this a little bit later, but um, I'll leave this up for the moment if you want to continue to participate. Um, so as Susan mentioned, I'm Erin Hannes. I'm the Curator of Academic Engagement here at Sheldon, and I'm really pleased to welcome all of you here for our first collection talk of the fall semester, um, A Troubling Future, A Discussion of Climate Change and Climate Anxiety. Before I introduce our panelists and moderator, I want to thank the supporters who made this program possible. The Hicks and Lead Endowment, D.F. Dillon Foundation, Phyllis Ackley, Kristen and Jeff Klein, Melanie and John Gross, Lincoln Industries, and Lisa and Tom Smith. Thank you also to our members, and of course, many thanks to all of you in the audience this evening. Um, thank you for joining us. So this program was inspired by the exhibition From Here to the Horizon, Photographs in Honor of Barry Lopez. The exhibition presents more than 90 works donated by 50 American photographers. And let me actually switch to this image here. Oops. I'm going to go back and repeat what I just said because this is not very eloquent at the moment. Okay. So this program was inspired by the exhibition From Here to the Horizon, Photographs in Honor of Barry Lopez. The exhibition presents more than 90 works donated by 50 American photographers to honor the late writer Barry Lopez, who wrote about the landscape in lyrical prose that offered a vivid and passionate account of humankind's relationship to the natural world. And as we increasingly hear about and experience the changing climate, we felt it was urgent to bring together an interdisciplinary group of artists and scholars to discuss climate change, the anxiety we may feel in the face of climate change, and actions we can take as well as resources we can explore. So after I introduce our panelists, I am going to turn this over to our moderator, and we will invite questions from the audience at the end, and we'll ask you to please speak into a microphone that we will be bringing. As you can see, one of our panelists is joining us remotely, so we want to be sure that she and everyone else um, in the room can hear the questions. And now it is my pleasure to introduce this evening's speakers, and I am going to do so in the order that they will initially present. So Martha Durr is a professor of applied climate science in the School of Natural Resources, where she has been a faculty since 2009. Her work focuses on climate change and understanding climate impacts. She spent seven years at the Alaska Climate Research Center, six years as director of the NOAA High Plains Regional Climate Center, and has served as the Nebraska State Climatologist since 2016. She was co-author on the 2018 U.S. National Climate Assessment, has published a book and more than 50 peer-reviewed articles on science. Her research has taken her from remote Alaska villages to the windswept Nebraska sandhills. And I will also add that she is incredibly busy. I know that I have heard she has more panel talks coming up um, even this weekend. Marion Bellinger is a Connecticut-based artist and educator who photographs the cultural landscape, particularly where geology and the built environment intersect. She is also a licensed psychotherapist. She's the recipient of numerous awards and honors, including a John Simon Guggenheim Fellowship. She was an honoree for the 2017 Spillman International Prize for Excellence in Photography and received two American Scandinavian Foundation Fellowships, among others. She is the author of four books, including Everglades, Outside and Within, and Rift, Fault. Marion teaches at the Hartford Art School and in the Graduate Liberal Studies Program at Wesleyan University. She also belongs to the two collectives, the Birthday Club and Environmental Photographers. And two of Marion's images are um, from her series of the Everglades are on view in the exhibition From Here to the Horizon. And here you can see um, a detailed image from a photograph that she took of mangroves. 
Shamanti Banerjee, who is joining us on the, the Zoom screen there, is an associate professor in the Department of Agricultural Economics. She does work on experimental and behavioral economics as they relate to environmental decision making. She has extensive experience working with producers in Nebraska and the Midwest on policy design and behavior associated with conservation land use practice adoption. She teaches an undergraduate course in environmental and natural resources economics and enjoys exposing students and other researchers to how economics can offer solutions to complex environmental problems. And lastly, Dana Fritz, who will moderate this evening's conversation, is the Hickson Lead Professor of Art in the School of Art, Art History and Design, where she primarily teaches photography. She is also a Center for Great Plains Studies Fellow and a member of the leadership and planning team for a Community Climate Resilience Institute here at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. Her recent book, Field Guide to a Hybrid Landscape, traces the forces shaping Nebraska's hand-planted forest. Her recent story map and artist book commission for Platte Basin Time Lapse, entitled Reforest, follows seedlings grown from reforestation in fire and beetle-damaged national forests. And now please welcome me in joining the panelists, and I'm going to turn things over to Dana. Thanks, Erin, um, and thanks to all of you for coming tonight. We're trying to pull off this kind of technological miracle here, so please bear with us <laughs> with our remote uh, panelists and multiple cameras and et cetera. So I'm, I'm gonna ask questions to the panelists about how our personal and professional lives led us to climate work, but I'm gonna start with myself. So. Um, I've spent my whole life in places where people talked about the weather and looked to the sky for what was coming our way. My husband and I are avid vegetable gardeners and have recently converted a large part of our yard to native prairie plants. So caring for these gardens makes us keenly aware of weather and climate. For the last 20 years, my work in photography has given me a visual and conceptual avenue to explore and learn about how we shape the land. My recent book about Nebraska's hand-planted forest was inspired by my interest in environmental history and how land management policies reflect ideas about climate change. In the late 1800s, the unique mixed grass ecosystem of the Nebraska sand hills was considered empty and unproductive, too dry and too windy by Euro-American settlers. Before dispossession, the generally treeless character of the land co-evolved with grazing bison and other herbivores, lightning caused wildfires and indigenous practices of burning that moved game and refreshed grass. In 1902, the first federal nursery was established to produce seedlings for Plains homesteads and the adjacent treeless land, tract of land near Halsey. At that time, tree planting was not used for carbon sequestration, but to mitigate the wind and evaporation of moisture. In other words, to change the unfavorable local climate. Trees were planted in tight rows that were not regularly thinned. The natural force of fire was suppressed for most of the 20th century because indigenous burning practices were not valued or understood as a critical part of forest and grassland ecosystems. Today, the Bessie Nursery has shifted focus from growing trees for the adjacent hand-planted forest to producing replacement seedlings for fire and beetle-damaged national forests in the Rocky Mountains. These increasingly catastrophic fires and beetle infestations are a result of drought, longer summers, and warmer winters caused by climate change. A decade ago, this seedling was planted in a campground clear cut that includes trees that were over 300 years old. In 2020, it seemed like the entire Western United States was on fire and the smoke filled our skies in Nebraska. With management practices that excluded regular thinning and burning, 
The extreme drought of 2022 brought two fires to Nebraska National Forest at Halsey that consumed half the living trees, as well as the 4-H camp and even the fire tower itself. That same year, fires were burning all over Nebraska, including in Lancaster County, which had the first fire evacuation in my memory. Between the increasing fires and temperatures, we are feeling climate change right here in Nebraska. And so I'm gonna start by asking Martha, I think, yeah, to talk about your personal and professional work that led you to climate work. Yeah, that was a great introduction. You touched on a lot of themes that I will also um, touch on. So um, I thought I would talk a little bit about just kind of some personal things just about me and growing up uh, in my early life and how that influenced my professional life uh, later on. So um, growing up, I'm the youngest of five kids, um, so a large family. We moved around a lot, so it's almost like I'm from a gypsy family in a way. I was born in Nebraska, but, but I grew up mostly in North Carolina. Um, my dad is from, from here, from rural Odo County, and he was the one who was always watching the weather, and that's something that I definitely got from him, um, just that interest in, in what's going on and observing the weather and being outside when there's severe weather happening was, was certainly of interest to me. Um, we were living in Nebraska City and I was about seven years old and there was a storm and at the time I was very scared and we spent the night in the basement um, and that really impacted me. I wanted to know what causes the, these kinds of events and how are people impacted by these storms. Um, so my, that influenced what I wanted to do as a profession. So I got an undergraduate degree in meteorology. My family lived in North Carolina at the time so that's where I went to school. Um, I went on to get a master's degree here uh, at the university. Um, I tried to find graduate research assistantships coming from a family that didn't have a lot of re financial resources. I was looking for somebody who could pay me to go to school. That was a big deal <laughs> for me. Um, so I studied light interaction through plant canopies and did some, some field work out at Mead. Um, and then I went on to the University of Minnesota. Um, blowing snow is a big issue uh, in the state of Minnesota and elsewhere, of course. Um, and so the project I worked on was, was very much an applied climate issue where we've got this problem of windblown snow that goes on the roadways. So how do we, how do we manage that? How do we solve that? Um, so we use living snow fences. Um, and so I helped design a web tool for road designers and engineers to um, where do you place a snow fence given the prevailing wind direction and how much snow you get in an area. Um, and it's still used today. And I graduated from there in 2002. So <laughs> that's, that's a really cool thing. Um, so it illustrates this idea of there's some sort of problem and how do we use science to fix it. Um, so, so I went to Alaska and that's the image that, that you see here and got to work um, with all kinds of environmental um, issues. The rates of change are significant in, in the high north and in the Arctic. Um, what you're seeing there is the Koyukuk River. Um, this is in Gates of the Arctic Park, which I haven't been to, but I've, I quickly found one as we were preparing for, <laughs> for, this, uh, for this event here. Um, I worked in interior Alaska looking at um, indigenous science and Western science and kind of blending the two. Um, there's communities there who have a subsistence lifestyle and culture, and because of climate change, their moose hunts and harvest, which is their primary source of protein, they weren't successful. So it was interesting to look at um, these interviews of what elders and people in the community are experiencing, and then data that I could look at and see and kind of blend those two aspects together. Um, so, so that kind of sparked my interest for, um, for applied climate work. And um, what I enjoy most about my position here is this, this kind of opportunity. Um, I've probably given um, hundreds of talks to thousands of people, and I don't think I've ever done one in an art museum, so this is great. It really speaks to um, how are we gonna tackle this really significant issue and, and these interdisciplinary conversations and ways of looking at it, I think is really good and really positive. Um, and I'm really happy to be a part of this. Oh, Shamanti, could you tell us about okay. your personal and professional life and how it led you to climate work? 
Thank you so much. Uh, first of all, thank you uh, to uh, the Sheldon uh, Museum for inviting me to this panel, as well as accommodating uh, my uh, conflicting schedule. You know, thank God for technology that I get to be at this event and uh, listen to my, you know, my fellow panelists who are uh, simply great and talk a little bit about what I do in the domain of um, climate change and human decision making. So a little bit about myself. I don't know if uh, the slide, I, I had a few slides up. Uh, uh, so the first one kind of, you know, positions uh, where I, you know, where my origin story, which is basically that, you know, I'm a first generation immigrant who moved from Eastern India to go to school at Penn State. And uh, I feel that a lot of my interactions with the environment kind of is on the basis of what I saw as my, uh, my own experiences while growing up in the city of Kolkata in Eastern India is that, you know, the summers were hot. But I remember this one day when I was in university as an undergraduate student and I, it felt like I, I, could, I could never stop sweating. It was like I sweated the whole day and I just remember thinking to myself, man, it's hot. But that was years ago. That was nearly 20 years ago, right? And so then, you know, if you could try, uh, proceed to the next slide, in uh, present day uh, United States, what I thought would be uh, pretty interesting to share with you is are these uh, uh, pictures of temperatures in Celsius, not in Fahrenheit, of three days in the past month. So the first one kind of, uh, you know, is the day where you can see the temperatures. You know, if anybody is uh, not familiar with the Celsius scale, that's pretty high. But what I want to draw uh, attention to is the fact that I shared that image to the left of the screen with my dad. And he was, uh, he is located in Kolkata, India. And he couldn't believe the fact that the temperatures in the Northern Hemisphere in a temperate zone was higher than what he is used to, even though, you know, there is the daytime temperature and the nighttime temperature. So, you know, and then, you know, the other two images are kind of, you know, demonstrating the fact that you see these temperature kind of parities across these, you know, the, these different regions, which is not something that we would expect. So in some sense, looking at the responses that, you know, I, I, of, you know, people in the audience in the word cloud, climate change is here. And so what do we kind of do about it? So that is where it comes in my professional work. I got my PhD from Penn State where I looked at policy design and how you can evaluate different farmland conservation policies to attain different environmental objectives as part of those policies and look at, the, look at it from an economics perspective. And after coming to UNL in 2010, that's, um, oh, sorry, 2014, that's pretty much what I have been doing. And in some sense, that's the work, the, the reason that I more recently have started connecting to any kind of work related to climate change is because uh, I have four-year-old twins and I look at them sometimes and I look at the, planet that they are inheriting. And I know for a fact, regardless of subjective evidence and objective evidence, that they are going to be in a world which is warmer than the world that I grew up in. So when I do my work on human decision making and climate change, at the back of my mind, I'm always thinking about my kids. I'm also thinking about my family back in India, who thankfully have the money to afford air conditioning. In, if you have ever been to that part of the world, it is extremely hot in the summertime. And in those tropical countries, it's very, very hard to survive without an air conditioning, but not everybody has that kind of money to be able to afford an air conditioner. So when I, look, you know, when I kind of talk, you know, do research or do, you know, uh, 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 teach classes on natural resource and environmental economics, these are the different you know, contexts and uh, perspectives that are in my mind. So I, I will um, stop with that. Thanks. Uh, Marion, could you tell us um, about your personal and professional work and how it led you here? Hi, everyone. Um, I'm so happy to be here and with these amazing panelists. Um, 
I grew up in Connecticut in a manufacturing valley. Uh, it was, um, you know, geologically very much a valley. We had the Nogtuck River that ran 40 miles through it. Um, I grew up before the Clean Water Act there and before the Clean Air Act. Both the, the water and the air were incredibly um, pungent and to toxic. The water was neon colored at times. There were, um, you know, cement walls that blocked the river off. There wasn't any living life along the river whatsoever. We had Uniroyal uh, Chemical Company, um, we had brass companies, glass companies, <laughs> all kinds of different industries that, you know, just thought this is a great place, can just put our waste into the river. And, um, but I was, you know, I lived in Connecticut, which is also really beautiful and pristine and um, not far from where I lived. It was, um, you know, we swam in really clean waters and rode bikes and hiked and, you know, it's your like picture of what a New England town might be. So, um, you know, I grew up in, a, in knowing that there, there was a problem with, with what we were doing to the land and, um, and I knew that geology was a part of it. It was all along that valley. Um, I couldn't even imagine like going down to that river. It, it was, you know, and we also knew that at, at one point it was clean. Naugatuck is, you know, Native American word, it means fork in the river. Um, and, you know, in a very short period of time, that river had been like destroyed. So I knew that, um, you know, way before climate change was being discussed, I knew that we were doing things to our environment that, that was very unhealthy. And I was distressed as a child. Um, I was distressed when people were smoking cigarettes and the smoke went into the air. You know, so I, I just kind of had this sense that um, things needed to be different. And they did get different in part because of globalization, but also because we, we passed, you know, regulations and waters and air became better because of that. Um, so I went to art school and um, I went to school in New York. And um, at that point, you know, I was like thinking I might do ceramics, um, I might do photography, you know, I did a little bit of both in school, graduated, went down, um, lived in New Orleans for almost a decade. And um, in terms of, you know, like a different climate. It was, it was like really a shocking place to be after New England. Um, and it was, it was funny when we moved down there, my husband was like a, a new reporter on the Times Picune. And as a new reporter, you know, they put him on the, uh, covering the levy uh, board. And, um, you know, nobody wanted that. It's like boring. Well, you know, a few years after we left, look what happened in New Orleans. And so, you know, there were all of these kinds of um, th like things that that I that drew me to think about the land, think about the ecosystem, think about where we live, how we live on this earth. And I started photographing the landscape. Um, my Guggenheim project was photographing the Everglades, but it was inside the preserved, what I like to think of as a museum, green Everglades, and then outside in the historic Everglades, which was, you know, it was drained and it was um, developed and um, for agriculture and, and houses and buildings. So even then, like that early project, I did that in 2002, um, I was aware that you know, we are shaping our environment in ways that, you know, that just wasn't sustainable. And um, so I should back up a little bit though to say that I got um, my MFA from Yale and once I graduated from Yale, I went to, almost immediately I started taking classes um, to be a psychotherapist. 
And so um, in 1993, you know, I started practicing as a psychotherapist, and I've, and I've had both practices going all of these years. And um, so when climate change started becoming um, real, you know, of course I was interested in that. And um, in recent years, my, my psychotherapy clients have become, um, you know, they're bringing it more into, into the therapy room. Um, people are distressed. They're wondering if they should have kids. They're wondering, you know, what they can do. They feel, younger people feel helpless. Older people don't want to really hear it. So, you know, it just goes on. And um, so I have really, for the first time in like a long career, my um, art, my art career and my therapy career have kind of um, settled out around the same subject. And I thought that was kind of amazing, so. Do you want to say anything about this life? Um, yes, so this, um, this is the cover of one of my books. After I photographed in the Everglades, you know, I thought where might there be a geologic um, boundary on the earth that people can't control or contain? And, um, and so I thought tectonic plates. So I photographed the two edges of the North, two land-based edges of the North American tectonic plate, uh, the, the um, San Andreas Fault, California, and the Mid-Atlantic Rift that runs through Iceland. And, um, and that was like an incredible project, you know, like the boundary of the, the edges of the plate itself, but also the boundary between the, the earth that we stand on and what's underneath, that is, it's just so active. Um, it's the next slide. Oh yes, I, um, I did a, um, a permanent installation at the Connecticut Agricultural Experimental Station. And um, my collaborator, Martha Lewis, and I like explored their archives. We went into the, uh, the weather um, records that, you know, from the 1800s really to the present. And we incorporated some of that into this um, bespoke kind of wallpaper that we used. And then um, I took some of the archival photographs and re-photographed them and reworked them, hung them in the wall. And so um, when, can, can I have the next slide please? When people go into, into their, um, you know, for consultations about the plants that have problems or the, you know, um, the insects that are invading their crops, um, they have a nice, like, place to sit. But at the same time during the pandemic, um, this, I was working on that during the pandemic, I had all of these, they allowed me to take materials home from the ag station. So I had all of these incredible um, photographs and books at my house that, that I ended up just kind of using in my own work. So I, this is called The Wired Forest, and um, it's about research stations, you know, within the land. And so I use some of the historic photographs from the ag station with some of my own photographs, um, pairing them together. Um, and this is from a recent body of work that I'm doing called Lost Lake. Um, it's made in, primarily in the woods near my house. And, um, and it's a confluence of two factors. One, like uh, climate change that's like impacting the woods itself where I live. And also the fact that um, I have a granddaughter that I would walk with in the woods and she's blind. And so it was like, how does she perceive the forest? And, you know, like, what is perception for her? So I, I started imagining, um, there are little things that she can see in colors. And I started imagining, like, maybe what she might see. And I started kind of um, adding certain things to my photographs that seemed kind of right in terms of climate change as well. You know, I mean, if I think back to the work in the Everglades, it was like kind of straight photography. It was untampered photographs, whereas these are tampered with in the same way that our land is. And this is another one from the same, same project from Lost Lake. Okay, thank you. Thanks. 
Okay, so uh, this question is for Martha. From your perspective as our state climatologist, how is climate change manifest globally and how are we feeling it here in Nebraska? What are the climate predictions for the near and far term? Yeah, so I've got um, kind of a slide deck that I wanted to go through that I thought would be best to, um, to answer this question. So um, you can read all these. I won't uh, read them to you. But the thing I wanted to point out with this slide is that the impacts to climate change that we're feeling are disproportional. And for me, that's one of the the heaviest things to deal with when, when I think about climate change is the people um, least responsible are the people that are impacted the most. And those communities that it, already life is hard, it's going to be much, much harder in the future. So that's a real um, key in a global manifestation of climate change is that life will get much more difficult for those that are not able to cope. Um, next slide. The action, we must take action. We should have taken action uh, decades ago, but we didn't, and that's, that's okay. <laughs> Let's do it now. Um, you see a couple of curves up there, and it's basically a global average temperature change. Uh, we don't want the red curve. One thing that you notice with that is things get completely unreasonable and probably unrecognizable for, for a Nebraska that, that it looks like today. Um, you'll also note that the rate of change, it keeps going up. Um, you know, how we live, the clothes we buy, where we grow our food, those kinds of decisions, that depends on stability in our climate system. And we don't have that if we don't act now. So, so action now is very, very important. Um, so this quote, I'll give you just a 30 seconds or so to read it. Um, it's one that I, I use in, in my class. I teach an intro to climate change class, and we talk about the science, the symptoms, and the solutions. And um, you know, I get asked a lot when another report comes out, I get asked you know, my opinion about it or thoughts on it. And this quote absolutely comes to mind when I, when I think of that is, then let's, let's do something about it. Let's implement changes, talk through solutions, act on it because the science, what's the use of, of studying this um, if we're just gonna sit around and wait for our predictions to come true? So um, a few comments on Nebraska's climate past. And the reason I'm showing this is think about um, Nebraska's climate future as not necessarily looking like what has happened in the past and the fact that things will be amplified and rates of change will be greater, right, going forward. So temperatures have risen, that's going to continue all seasons, all months. Daytime highs, nighttime lows are gonna go up. The variability in precipitation, uh, we've seen that so far and that's gonna continue to happen. Um, going from too much water to too little water and quickly. Um, we had the third wettest year on record in 2019 and then the faucet gets turned off and most of Nebraska has been in drought conditions um, since then. Unfortunately, it's looking like it's gonna continue drought. Um, the extreme weather events, um, the, there's a term that, uh, that some of my colleagues use called weather weirding, which I think is a great example. Um, weather events that happen out outside of the time that we would normally expect them, and I'll have an example in just a moment of this, things just getting more extreme and, and more amplified. Um, we already live in a very extreme climate, right? In Nebraska, we're a highly continental climate, um, but that's gonna be amplified because of climate change. Um, and this rate of change is accelerating going forward. So, um, you know, think of our history as being more stable than, than our future is going to be. Um, so part of the question was thinking about our climate outlook, looking forward, and climate projections, go out um, about 100 years or so. So we can look into the next century. Um, and actually, the, the skill and accuracy of, of climate predictions are better when we think of a scale of 2050 as opposed to next year. It's, there's lots of variability and nuances in the system, and it can be really difficult to predict next year. But it's actually easier um, to predict decades out into the future. But, we're gonna be warmer, potentially very warm, if we, if we don't act and reduce greenhouse gas emissions and mitigate climate change. 
um, then we could be potentially very warm. It could be more like uh, Oklahoma or Texas. Um, let's see, I've got uh, my cheat sheet right here on my phone, so that's why I keep looking down. More heat. Um, we've had significant heat um, this summer. We're breaking records globally. Um, daily records have been broken across Nebraska, right? It's very warm. July was the warmest month, a month on record, I think, um, going back to 1895 for the globe. Then August was the warmest August on record, and so there's much more heat in the system. Um, heat is actually the number one um, it causes the highest mortality um, rate. So it's a severe weather event that is linked to high mortality. So that is certainly an issue. Um, so here is uh, an image. There were 30 tornadoes in December of 2021. Yes, it was the warmest December on record, and we had something that typically happens in July and August. It's called a derecho. It's a, it's a big um, straight line wind event, a storm system that can spawn tornadoes and, uh, and certainly have implications. But we don't, we're not severe weather aware in December typically. So thinking about these kinds of events happening outside of the window that we normally expect them. Um, and then I'll mention fire. So wildfires were mentioned earlier, um, happening here locally in Nebraska, as well as, as elsewhere. And, and maybe you can go on to the next one. Um, you know, so I talked about just very high level, some of the changes that, that we could potentially see in Nebraska. Well, changes elsewhere certainly also matter. And I'm just putting a recent example of this. Um, so this is from Alliance, I think, uh, is the, the image that I took from, uh, from a Scotts Bluff newspaper. Um, air quality, for this, we're feeling climate change right now, right? Those who have respiratory systems that are compromised when we get a smoke event from wildfires happening in the Pacific Northwest, th these originated in Canada. Um, it's getting warmer, it's getting drier, we're more susceptible to wildfires. There, this is another way that we're feeling climate change. Um, and we'll skip, let's um, go to the next one. I feel like I'm taking a little too much time here. So um, yeah, I'm just gonna flip through kind of perceptions of climate change. So I've talked about in a broad level view of kind of what the outlook is. So let's think about um, how do people feel about climate change? And most of us, maybe we feel kind of all in the, we're very concerned probably here in this audience, but not everybody is obviously, which is why we don't have the action in place that we should. Um, so this slide, I just, um, want to give a spectrum of, of people's thoughts, and it's, it's anecdotal data, and it's based on kind of um, the questions that I've, get, that I've received and the groups that I've spoken with, what are the comments, um, and how do people feel about it? And so I kind of put um, Nebraska in these different buckets, and so there is a group, um, and the Yale Project on Climate Communications, I think, calls it the um, dismissive, or I forget their exact um, wording for it, but it's those that are harmful. They're actively, um, pers they're not um, supporting climate solutions, um, but that bucket is definitely getting smaller um, from, from my perspective anyway, and those that I engage with. Um, and then we have, the, in the middle there, there's active participants, and that's a lot of the people that I engage with are in this role, and probably a lot of us um, here in this room, where we're, um, maybe we, we're on citizens' climate lobby, or we're, um, we're taking measures to change our behavior and change policy and those kinds of things. Um, and then it seems like um, a majority, probably, of Nebraska is kind of in this curious category. Maybe they used to be in the harmful category, and then something like the flood of 2019 happened, and they couldn't plant, and they start asking, are, are things like this gonna happen uh, more frequently or should I be concerned about this? And the, the amount of extreme weather events that we're getting is people are feeling it and it's very local and relevant and impactful for them. Um, so, so this is kind of how I categorize Nebraska's perceptions um, on climate change. And I've just got one more slide here. Um, 
to kind of give a, a hopeful message. And so, um, so on the right, there is an image from the CL project on climate communication. And I'm trying to remember what, answer, what question I put. Um, citizens should be doing more about climate change. Um, and it's 60%, so it's not a strong majority, but it is above 50%. And actually, um, if you were to zoom out and look at um, all of the US, we're in the majority. People think that, yes, I should be doing more about climate change and global warming. Um, and then one thing I did want to mention is kind of a relatively new effort that's taking place within the state of Nebraska is an agency has received federal funds to develop a comprehensive climate plan and a priority climate action plan. They're engaging with underserved communities. Um, they're working with multiple partners and cities and, and various agencies across Nebraska to look at greenhouse gas reductions emissions among the primary sectors in the state. And so this is um, the, the first of its kind that I'm aware of, at least here locally. So these kinds of, thinking about these kinds of things do give me hope going forward. Thanks, Martha. Uh, so Shmanti, I wonder if you could tell us how your work as an agricultural economist um, connects land use and management to climate change, and is climate change affecting decision making among agricultural producers or others you study, and what makes people act or change their actions? Thank you so much, uh, Dana. It's uh, uh, great to hear all you know all the work that the you know the panelists are doing. And what I am going to do is basically you know draw uh, refer back to what each of your experiences have been and kind of connect that to my work. So uh, my first question was you know and I'm looking at my second screen and we can come to the slides later. I don't have slides per se pre uh, prepared for this. I just thought you know I just give a very broad and general overview of the kind of exciting work, well, exciting to me that I've been doing is how does your work as an agricultural economist connect land use management to climate change? So at the beginning of uh, uh, today's uh, discussion, Dana was talking about the landscape in Nebraska and how uh, the introduction of, excuse me, introduction of intensive agriculture has uh, led to uh, the, the transformation of the landscape. And what I have been doing as part of one of my projects is looking at the role of regenerative grazing in managing grasslands and by that association, whether uh, we can, uh, uh, what are the different policy mechanisms that can incentivize uh, producers in uh, different uh, Northern Great Plains states to implement, uh, 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 implement land use practices, which would not only uh, regenerate those grasslands, but also lead to improved soil health through increased, uh, increased carbon sequestration and other benefits. So I've had, the, as part of this project, I've had the opportunity to talk to a lot of ranchers in Nebraska, Montana, South Dakota, and North Dakota. And it's pretty interesting to see their perspectives on this particular issue, because you have ranchers who talk about how climate change is not happening, but they care a lot about the land. And they care a lot about the emissions that their cattle are emitting. And on the other hand, you have ranchers who know, who believe that climate change is happening and they are uh, uh, implementing practices, the very same practices as the first group who don't want to talk about climate change, but they are implementing those practices on their operations to make sure that they can reduce their ecological footprint, their carbon footprint. So it's a part of my research is basically to look at these diverse motiva motivations that these different produce, excuse me, these different producers have and how you can look at it from an economic perspective and design policies which would incentivize both groups to act in a way which would be beneficial for the climate. So that is one part of my work. The second question is, is climate change affecting decision making among agri agricultural producers or others that you study? And 
I'm in order to do that, I'm going to talk a little bit about my experiences with teaching my undergraduate class in environmental and natural resources economics. And a shameless plug for any student in the audience who is interested in this and who would like to know about how economics matters to this. You know, I teach this class every spring. And if you could bring up the slides that I had, there is a slide that shows, um, uh, I'm going to also look at it at my end, that talks about, you know, the carbon dioxide emissions. And why do I bring this up as something that I do as part of my climate work? If you look at the different countries, you can see that China, USA, India, you know, these are the names of these countries get tossed around a lot when you're thinking about climate change. But what is interesting is not only the total amount of emissions, but the data in the on the next slide, which talks about per capita emissions. And that is where, you know, that, in my mind, that's where the action is, for a lack of the better word, because that is where I believe understanding can happen. And this is the kind of information that I show to my students, because not only do they need to know where emissions are happening, but also globally speaking, who is responsible for these emissions. So you will see on this particular infographic, which, by the way, is, uh, you know, I borrowed it from the internet, and it's brilliant, I couldn't have generated something as cool as this one, that looks at the per capita emissions. And you can see that the total amount of per capita emissions for China is 7.1, which is literally half of the per capita emissions of the United States. So this matters to policymaking because which number are you going to rely on? Are you going to rely on the number that looks at the total amount of emissions that is generated by China? Or are you going to look at the number that is telling you how much is each indiv individual citizen in a particular country emitting? These is the, this is the type of information that I present to my students because it is important for them to kind of start thinking about the complexities associated with any kind of decision making related to clim uh, climate change. All right. Um, so the, then moving on to the next slide, the other thing that I also talk about in my class is, you know, communicating the effects of climate change. And when I first saw these figures, I don't know if anybody in the room has seen these figures before. The first thing that I thought is, oh, so pretty. But the thing is, is that this is a, these are figures that are not only telling you how temperatures are increasing in Vancouver and Calgary, but it's also telling you about the spread. And that is, I think, something that we all of us in this room need to be reminded us about, is the variation, not only the fact that there are increasing trends in temperature, but also the variation. And I think that, you know, all of us are at this event because we, to varying degrees, understand about this variation. But this is something which is very, very important for my students, my undergraduate students to understand, because they are grappling with so many different types of challenges when it comes to climate change. And I also want to kind of allude back to what Marion said about the different types of clients that she talks to, where there are these older people who don't want to you know, talk about climate change, and these younger folks who want to you know, who are too despaired to talk about it, right? And a lot of these variations are what I look at in my research when looking at producer decision-making is how does age matter to producers, uh, matter in terms of producers uh, uh, adopting different types of land use practices, which would be beneficial for the environment. So moving on to the next slide, the... I'm going to refer back to the question, what makes people act or change their actions? And in order to be able to do that, I wanted to pull up this email. If you are a UNL employee or associated with the UNL, you must have seen this email that went out, I believe, on the 22nd of August, so last month. I was, um, I was, I guess I felt a lot of things when I saw this email. 
which was I, 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 I commend Dr. Zeleny for sending this email out, right? But this talked about basically, you know, the, the stressed systems under extreme heat events at UNL. But more importantly, it also talked about behaviors and what you need to do. And please, you know, I've highlighted that with the box on the screen is that, you know, what do you need to do? Standard reminders about turning the lights off, turning computers and other appliances law, uh, or, uh, off or closing window blinds. The challenge is, is that these are things that we sometimes as, you know, the citizen, we perceive as so marginal. The changes are so marginal that we don't realize that these small changes that we can make can have very big consequences when considered in aggregate. One of the things that this email talks about is reduction of temperatures a little bit to manage the energy needs of, uh, of the university. And maybe that's what we need to do. Right. And those are the kinds of behaviors that we need to adopt and economics can help there. agricultural economics can help there because we can look at the role of the way in which information is presented. So in my introduction, it was mentioned that I am an experimental economic uh, economist. So one of an experimental idea right here, right now would be to take this very email that was sent out by UNL administration and looking at the impact of this email in the behavior of students in two different dorms. If those students in those dorms had not seen that in this email before. And that would give us an idea about how information messaging coming from these key individuals within our you know, social ecosystem, if you will, can impact our decision making and ultimately reduce the impact, our ecological footprint and carbon footprint, and you know, kind of release some of the stressors. So next slide, please. I, you know, in terms of what can people do in decisions, and again, as I said, I teach this class and this is a redacted version of a discussion thread, which talks about what needs to be done, you know, and that is, is that, you know, here is, an, I, I, um, the discussion was about, you know, how have your attitudes changed? I asked my students, you know, what have you, you know, uh, on the basis of the subject matter that I have exposed you to, what, how has your attitude changed? And I know this is a lot of text, so I'm just going to read a little bit of it, you know, which, and which kind of blew my mind to actually see change like this happening because of content that is being provided, presented to my students is that, you know, um, now that, you know, before taking this class, I didn't care and heard very little about climate change and thought to myself, people were just overreacting. Now that I have seen the data and effects, not just in United States, but worldwide, it is something that people need to be more educated on. If people were educated on this topic sooner, so that's a point of intervention right there from an, a fellow undergraduate uh, student in our university. Intervention needs to happen sooner, earlier, and in school. Not saying that it's not happening, but it needs to happen sooner everywhere. So if people were educated on this topic sooner than what then I was as a junior in college, blew my mind. I believe there would be less carbon dioxide going into the air. And here's the thing, this person talks about experiences, you know, day-to-day -day experiences, you know, fun experiences like, you know, bonfires every night. And now, you know, being exposed to objective evidence, factual evidence about climate change is making this person question those behaviors. I'm not saying, saying that those behaviors are wrong, but I think that behaviors need to be re-evaluated in the world that we live in, right? And this person says is that now by learning about these things, I bike to work and that's great for my, my health. So that's another thing that, you know, uh, uh, I talk about with my students is how you can basically start small, start early and also look not only at the benefits to society, but also benefits to yourself 
in terms of a better environment and also in terms of uh, better uh, you know, outcomes in other decision domains, such as uh, health outcomes, when you are trying to make changes uh, in your uh, in your day to day life to deal with climate change. So uh, I'm going to stop at that with my slides. Thank you Thanks. so much. That's so interesting about your student. Um, oh, I love it. Yeah, <laughs> that's that's you know that's great. That's like that's that's impact right there. Yeah. Made me happy that day. <laughs> So the exhibition upstairs entitled From Here to the Horizon, Photographs in Honor of Barry Lopez was inspired by a book the late environmental writer Barry Lopez and his wife Deborah Gwartney edited called Home Ground, A Guide to the American Landscape. It's a glossary of topography that offers precise yet poetic definitions of landforms. Botany professor and member of the Citizen Potawatomi Nation, Robin Wall Kimmerer writes, names are the way we humans build relationships, not only with each other, but with the living world. So calling a place by name puts us in relation to it and brings us into interbeing. While the book and exhibition were not intended to be about climate change per se, they do offer ways to learn about the land and by extension, to care about it as part of our interconnected world. So Marion, could you tell us about your prints that correspond with the terms mangrove swamp and canal in the exhibition? How can they be understood from a climate change lens? And are there other photographs that can also be read through a climate change lens? Yes. So both were made as part of my Everglades project. Everglades boundary was made in 2004, and it pictures the eastern edge boundary of the park near the visitor center. On the right of the canal, we see a lush landscape filled with greenery, while the other edge of the canal is barren. I want you to try to imagine how this image would be different if the Everglades had not been drained. Historically, waters flowed down from the Kissimmee River overflowed the banks of Lake Okeechobee and moved in a slow, shallow sheet across South Florida into the Florida Bay. It was one continuous wilderness, like what Everglades Park National Park is like today. In my photograph, the park boundary runs through the middle of the canal. There is no buffer zone whatsoever. Historically, there would have been no canal here, no agricultural fields. By the way, there are no natural rivers in South Florida all water, waterways have been canalized. One drives through miles of agricultural fields to arrive at the park. Once there, the sounds of non-human creatures fill the air. Littered roadways have given way to a pristine landscape where, where turtles cross the road and spider webs glitter in the sun. There is a diversity of ecosystems, hardwood hammock, pineland, freshwater marl prairie, freshwater slough, cypress swamp, coastal lowland, mangrove, marine, and estuarine. In respect to climate change, the Everglades are vulnerable to sea level rise as, as the land is almost flat. Saltwater intrusion puts the aquifers at high risk for contamination, especially as the limestone bedrock is porous and soft. During droughts, the lack of fresh water also puts the peatland essential to the formation of habitats, which sequesters carbon at risk. And all of the um, pumping of water out to sea has um, made the aquifer smaller. So even if it were to fill up, it would never get back to historic levels. Um, Mangroves, Everglades City, was made in 2002. Mangroves are the superheroes of the wetlands. They are impenetrable, impenetrable to humans, but are home to a plethora of species. Manatee, tarpon, lobster, egrets, herons, rosette, spoonbills, snails, shrimps, crabs, sponges, oysters, and more. I absolutely love the mangrove forest. They straddle the boundary between land and sea, nature and culture. Mangroves are prehistoric prehistoric. The oldest known fossils date to 75 million years ago. 
They were distributed around the planet in part due to the movement of tectonic plates. Mangroves filter nitrates, phosphates, and other pollutants from the water. And it's worth noting that the Everglades water flows from Okeechobee, which is the most polluted of all waters in Florida. They help to uh, reduce erosion and absorb storm surge during hurricanes and high tides. Their roots help to build and bind soils. They also capture massive amounts of carbon dioxide emissions and other greenhouse gases from the atmosphere, trapping and storing them in their carbon-rich soils. Mangroves are under threat from pollution, development, and climate. When cleared for development, the stored carbon is released into the air as CO2. Um, in 2000, Congress had passed the Comprehensive Everglades Restoration Act. It has also, it has been evident that the draining of the Everglades created an ecological disaster. Estimates to completely complete the restoration are now up to 50 years. And then I wanted to talk about um, a piece um, in the show by Robert Adams. Um, Robert Adams is, let's see, I had, let me just bring this up in my phone. Okay, Robert Adams um, has always been like an amazing um, photographer, but he's influenced my work to a tremendous degree. And um, so this photograph of a clear cut um, forest is, you know, obviously very upsetting to see. And I want to just read to you what Rob Robert Adams has written about the process of photographing in a violently altered landscape. He says, when I am photographing in clear cuts, I know that what has brought me there is a sense of the world coming apart. But after I've been there long enough to get over my shock at the violence, and after I've been working an hour or two, I am absorbed in the structure of things as they appear in the finder, in the camera's viewfinder. I'm not thinking only about the disaster. I'm discovering things in sunlight. You can stand in the most hopeless place, and if it's in sunlight, you can experience moments that are right and that are whole. And um, in his work and his like long career of being a photographer and a writer, um, Robert Adams has revealed like elements of the landscape that um, have been hard to see, but he's done it with such um, amazing kind of grace and generosity. And I think that you know it's um, it's an example of um, what art can can bring to us all when we want to be inspired by both beauty and grace, but um, you know, but seeing the world as um, kind of through clear eyes as well. So, thanks. Um, well, so many of the works upstairs moved me to think about um, the consequences of our actions regarding climate change. And so, one of my favorites uh, is Terry Evans' aerial photograph of the braided channels in our beloved Platte River. And it reminded me of seeing the same river in the past year that was nearly dry from our long drought and the subsequent irrigation water that's diverted from it. And so, you know, that's not probably what Terry was thinking when she made this photograph, but now we look at it and remember uh, what's happened since then. And this is 1990. Um, so, I think there's a photograph that Samanti wanted to talk about next. Sure. So when going through this, uh, the pictures of this excellent exhibition, the one that really spoke to me is this one, which is, uh, you know, 17 Palms Oasis uh, yeah, from California. And, you know, I just, um, you know, I'm an economist. I look at people's decisions and how you can make them behave in a particular way to maximize social goals. And this picture spoke to me because it talked about coordination. It talked about people coming together and how if you come together, even if circumstances are not in your favor, you have a good shot of succeeding or, you know, at least surviving. 
And in some sense, that's the mode that we are in. And that's the that's what I would like everybody in this room, in Lincoln, everywhere to think about is that we are in this together. And if we are together, then we can achieve these, we can achieve solutions, whatever the solutions might be. In this case, it's the survival of these farms in this oasis by optimizing the use of the resource, which in this case happens to be water in this very, very arid landscape. So that's what, you know, that uh, it's, it's a beautiful picture that, you know, kind of speaks to where we need to be and where we need, you know, and just stay there in that headspace, so to speak. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, Martha, I wondered if you had any thoughts about any of those photographs. Yeah, I think um, the one of the Platte River definitely spoke to me just in terms of we're looking at this natural feature on the landscape and, um, you know, I'm curious about how others view that. Is it something that a, a resource, you know, how we view our environment, really, um, and it could be said for Samante's picture as well, um, is it something that we will, um, you know, see from afar and appreciate the beauty of, or is it a resource that we will use, and in what way will we use it? And if there, if it runs dry, if it's a limited amount, how do we equitably distribute that resource? Um, so, so to me, it just definitely speaks to how we view and value our environment, and does it have a voice when we think about these climate solutions? Thanks. Um, I wonder if we could maybe look at the word cloud really quick and get um, responses from Martha and Samanti. Maybe Marianne and I will. <laughs> yeah. So I figured since we took the time to make the word cloud, we would look at it. Um, Martha, do you want to address so, it? Something, obviously, the um, time is the biggest word, and are we going, do, will we have enough time? Are we going to run out of time? Um, and extinction is the second biggest, I mean, that, to me, that identif that's a finality thing, right? We're not going to recover from that. So, so what, that's what pops out at me, is acting in enough time to prevent the, the, the absolute worst case scenario, and preventing something that we can't uh, recover from. These are it very. Just moved. The the word club just moved. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. Yeah, that's okay. Go ahead, Samanti. Um, so I was uh, I was thinking about something that uh, spoke to me was um, inequality, and uh, you know Martha had this in her one of her first slides about the fact that you know it's not going to be felt similarly by everyone. You know, I live in the United States and um, I'm, I'm fairly well off financially to be able to afford the things that one needs to be able to afford to live in an increasing warming world. But not everybody is, um, um, is, is, uh, is as fortunate as I am and as many of us are. So that is something that we really need to think about, I, be, I believe, you know, and I, I, was, I was glad to see that you know that term made it to the word cloud. I did see that you know there are, there are lots of uh, the uh, words which have a negative uh, uh, aspect to it, and uh, you know that's the that that's where we are at this point of time, and we need to kind of um, find a way out, if you will. So I, I will leave it at that. Thanks. I mean, I want to thank everyone for participating in the word cloud, and I'm just still struck by the word time in the middle, and I feel like, okay, <laughs> yeah, that's really important. Um, we just have um, a little bit more. Um, sometimes the recognition of our climate emergency can understandably lead to despair or disengagement, but I wanted to end this discussion on a more positive note. I'm an avid reader of Rebecca Solnit's writing across her recurring subjects of feminism, landscape photography, and the environment. She's written extensively on the idea of hope. Invoking James Baldwin's famous proclamation that, quote, not everything that is faced can be changed, but nothing can be changed until it is faced. Solnit writes, it's important to emphasize that hope is only a beginning. It's not a substitute for action. 
only a basis for it. So if you need some good news that is grounded in science and history, Solnit's most recent edited volume with Thelma Young Lutuna Tubua, Tubua entitled Not Too Late, Changing the Climate Story from Despair to Possibility is a good entry point. And I'd like to ask our panel, what advice do you have for us moving forward? What can we do to slow the rate of global warming or how can we cope with this rapid change and the loss that we're already experiencing? Mary, do you want to address that first? Sure. Well, we can't give up. We need to empower ourselves to move forward, make space for pleasure, community in our lives, slow down, pay attention to beauty, and there's so much of it in the world. Um, we are all present in this wonderful museum, attending this talk, being curious, um, thinking about questions and um, talking like about this difficult topic. Um, we should like acknowledge that, that we're here together in an art museum talking about climate change and art. And I think that's pretty wonderful. Um, but there are so many ways that we can all make a difference. The small actions count. Volunteer with causes you care about. It could be at a local park, a community garden, a soup kitchen, vote. Um, there's a website that's up behind me on the, on the screen um, that has a terrific resources. Um, uh, yeah, all of those, like, it's really pretty comprehensive. Um, and um, you can find information, classes, books, guided meditations, information on climate cafes, and more. One thing we all need to do is to learn to live with contradiction, how to live with meaning, purpose, and joy during this time even though the state of our future is tenuous. Most important is to take care of yourself, cultivate compassion, celebrate success, eat well, limit social media, foster a support network, um, and seek out professional help if you need to. Remember that climate-related distress is an appropriate response to the situation in which we find ourselves. Um, we need to learn to thrive despite it all. That alone will make a difference. Martha, do you have some, thanks, Marian. Uh, Martha, do you have some advice for us? That was great. What can we um, do? I really like take care of yourself because if you're not in a good place, um, personally, emotionally, mentally, then your actions probably won't be very meaningful or lasting. For, they'll be difficult to keep up with. Um, yeah, I'll just touch on a few things here. Um, how do, you know, self-evaluating. How do I think of the environment? You know, how how do I view it? Um, what do I consume and how much? I mean, consumption is, is, is a big issue, and so just kind of doing some self-reflection on, on that I think is really important. Understanding what your own strengths are and, and using that, right? We all have certain things that we're good at, so use that um, as your form of action, whatever that may be. Maybe you want to run for office or maybe you want to more work quietly in the background. Whatever your strength is, um, uh, build on that. Also recognize that it's a process, and so if you if you plant one tree, if you save one grocery bag, right? That's not. It's you know try and, and practice these actions. So incorporate that into into your kind of your regular routine and um, and and not giving up and recognizing that it is okay to step back from whatever action um, that that you're that you're working on. Um, and advocacy, I tell this a lot to, to students because um, they're, they're very concerned um, about this issue and I, I tell them that advocacy doesn't have to consume your whole life and you can be a person and do fun things um, and, and still tackling this issue of climate change. Thanks. Samanti, do you want to give us some ideas for what we can do? I don't have ideas. I agree with uh, what... Uh, you know, all of you have said. And the one advice that I have is to cultivate empathy, you know, and empathy for others. Because I, I think that we can do a lot about climate change in our own lives when we think about how climate change is impacting others. So uh, that that's one of, you know, one part of my advice. And the other part of the advice is, you know, follow the science. 
and rely on data, even if that data might not agree with your beliefs about, you know, there's going to be a lot of cognitive dissonance. There's going to be a lot of pressure, cognitively speaking, uh, uh, on, you know, the decisions that you are going to take. But the advice is to follow the facts and kind of find a balance between subjective evidence, subjective views and objective evidence and make a decision that is good for yourself and the people around you, keeping in mind the downstream impacts that can happen as a result of those choices. So I will leave it at that. Thank you. Um, I want to thank all of you so much for your contributions to this panel. And I'm wondering, Erin, do we have time for like a couple questions or do we need to? Yeah. Um, Thank you all so very much. And thank you all for sticking around. Um, yes, we would love if it's okay. I know we're running later than we usually do for an event like this, but um, I would love to open it up for a couple of questions on such an important topic and to give you all a chance to, to ask. So we do have a microphone um, in the back there. So this is a question for Martha. Your slide that showed uh, the state of Nebraska and the percentage of people who believe or want to take action about climate change showed two counties with the highest scores. One of those counties was Lancaster County. So I'm assuming that's, we're preaching to the choir here. What was the second county? I believe it's Thurston, it but Thurston? I'm not sure. Is it Thurston County? Yes, I believe so, so what explains that? And could you riff on that a little bit? Because I think there's something buried in there that is a theme that's been talked about, but maybe you could bring it forth a little bit. Yes. Sure. Um, so, and um, I'm trying to recall if that's where there are indigenous communities located there. Yes, um, so. Oh, okay, yes. <laughs> that, yes, yes. Um, so largely driven by the fact that those, um, those communities, right, they are, um, they don't have resources to cope. They are impacted most strongly. And um, indigenous views in particular, there isn't a convincing of, of th that climate change is real. And so it's definitely something that permeates the culture and they're actively engaged in. So I would, I would think just the socioeconomic conditions um, as well as the, the thought process and the thinking and how, how the environment is viewed. So, <laughs> yes, so the question was, can we, can we learn something from indigenous communities? And uh, absolutely, I, so I've had the privilege of working with various um, indigenous communities, starting in, in Alaska in 2007 and then continuing on to some Plains tribes. And they're, um, I mean, they're, they're at the forefront. Um, to me, the thing that's, that is striking is the environment is our relatives, and and that's just, it's such a different way of thinking. Um, it isn't about profit, it isn't about the things that maybe most of us normally think about, but it's, it's you're looking generations forward, and you're lessening your environmental impact. Um, so I, I think there's, there's a lot to be learned there, and that's, for me personally and professionally, that's why I continue to engage with indigenous communities, is so I can, I consider myself kind of a lifelong learner um, of those communities. My question is for Martha, and um, we know within climate change that there there's migration of animals happening currently at a faster rate and things like that, but in your realm, working with the state, are there talks or plans for human migration while occupation may need to change or find refuge from natural disaster? Um, that's a great question. I, um, I, I'm just trying to go through my Rolodex of kind of interactions. I, I haven't been directly involved in those conversations, um, 
I've, I've engaged a little bit with um, environmental health communities and kind of in the public health sector, as well as some municipalities. Um, my guess is that it would be, we'd be thinking about those things at, at the local level. Are we gonna have enough services to provide for, for the influx of people that are gonna be moving here? And the trend anyway is for people to move from rural to urban areas. Um, so, so that issue is being looked at in that sense, I believe. Um, so, so that's about as much as I can speak to that specific aspect. Thank you. Um, I have a, oh, sorry. Okay, I did my senior thesis on the Alton ethanol plant in Mead, Nebraska. And for anyone not familiar with the idea, or the concept, it's an ethanol plant that was used by big agriculture partners um, across America who brought their treated seed corn to Mead, Nebraska and had it processed there. And it, it really did a number on the environment. I'm wondering if you have ideas on how we can help our fellow Nebraskans that are impacted when they're in these small communities that have no protection against the kind of things that are going into their water. What kind of action that we can do to promote regulation and just basically take care of our communities? <laughs> um, or doing your research on that, it's so important. Yeah, um, it's a good question. I, you know, my first thought would be to think about um, kind of permitting and, you know, how, um, what sort of industries and practices do we want to promote and foster and um, let into the state, so to speak. Um, I don't know the history of, of Alden and how long they've been here, but you know, that would be one suggestion is, is just looking at, you know, for future cases of, of, an, of another event of that, um, um, trying to look at policy and to see can we, uh, can we vet, can we create policy that will prevent something, a company like this, um, from existing here locally. Um, you know, engaging Nebraska Department of, of Energy and the Environment, you know, looking at that level to see what's what's currently in place. I'm not, I can't quite speak to, um, you know, policies and regulations that are, that are currently in place, but that would be another thing just to gauge kind of what, um, what are the policies now, see how we can revamp them. Can we get people to serve on local um, resource district boards um, to to prevent this kind of thing from happening and those kinds of things. I would like to add to that uh, response by saying that one of the ways in which uh, economics can help in this regard is to basically provide values of costs and benefits to people and natural resource and the ecosystem in that area. Because like it or not, if there has to be a policy, then the policy has to be associated with the number. And in that sense, if we want to keep, or if we want to regulate industries such as this, and I don't have the backstory on that ethanol plant either, that's one of the things. We need to have a benefit cost analysis number, a net benefit, or in this case, a cost number on the books on the basis of which to have policy making going on. Okay. Well, I think with that, I want to thank everyone for coming. Do you want me to put up the last little multiple choice poll? My, my panelists, I, we have um, one last poll. If you are interested and willing to participate, um, we know this is a heavy topic, very um, relevant and timely, but we did also hope that we would leave you all with some, some ideas of moving forward. So if you're interested in participating, we would love to see where things stand, but um, I really want to thank you all for coming this evening. Um, please join us for future events here at Sheldon, and if you haven't had a chance to explore the exhibition from here to the horizon, please do come back. It is open through December 21st. So thank you, and stay safe. Have a wonderful evening. Thank you so much.